It's got its problems, but you know, everywhere does. Exactly, exactly. Well, Byron, welcome to the Not So Millennial Podcast. I'm so excited to have you on here, literally stoked. Even Thanks. more to represent. Yeah. I love it, it looks great. <laughs> Thanks, whoever made these are really good. Is it Kingdom Shop? Cause yeah, kingdomofficialshop.com. Kingdom Official Shop, like it's really high quality. Yeah, it's good love stuff, it. very nice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so first of all, how have you been? Since, I mean, pandemic, how are you mentally? Like, what's, what's going on in your world? I'm doing fine. Um, doing well. Just hanging out with my wife, Juliet, and our two girls. And getting, getting through it like everybody else, you know? It's a strange time, but I'm relatively lucky compared to many other people. So uh, I can't really complain about anything. You know, obviously miss, miss life as it was, but, you know, we'll get through it. We will. We always do. It's going to get better someday, right? Yeah. Slowly, slowly, but surely it will. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I actually had the honor of talking to your wife and she is so amazing. Totally yeah. get why you married her. She's, so, like, she's wonderful. She is. She's a sweetheart, really. I mean, I just felt her energy through the computer. I was like, oh, <laughs> I like her. Yeah. She does have a very, a very kind, sweet energy. It's great. So I have so many questions for you today. I actually only have like 11, but we'll get through them. Yeah. Um, but be, you know, feel, feel comfortable telling us like where you got started. How, cause the, the whole thing about this show is, you know, the not so millennial podcast. I have um, a business. I own a social media marketing agency. I have 10 streams of revenue. I'm hustling as a pop artist. Like, that's why I created this show because I wanted to. I wanted to show people that there are millennials because you know we get a bad rep. That um, there there are millennials that work and we hustle and you know we are chasing our dreams and we're doing what we can. And I love talking to other people who have done incredible things. I learn from you on this podcast and learn where you came from. So my first question is, you know, how did you get your start? Well, I got my start. Right after college, I drove out to, I decided that I wanted to be a screenwriter towards the end of college. It sort of occurred to me that that's what I wanted to do. I didn't really know much about it or how to do it. Uh, so after graduation, I worked a couple jobs, waiting tables around Atlanta just to save up enough cash to get out here. And once I got a couple thousand dollars, I just got in a car with my buddy and we drove out. He was just going to, he drove out with me and then flew back because he wasn't coming out here to live. Uh, and it drove out and then just started trying to get a sense of what Los Angeles was all about, trying to find a job, and then trying to understand how do you penetrate this business? Because when you don't know anybody and you come out here not knowing anybody, it, it seems, um, it's very daunting. You, you sort of don't know how to get in or where to get in or what you should be doing. So I started trying to figure that out. Uh, in the meantime, searching for a job so I could have money to pay my bills, you know, pay for my apartment and all that. And I got a job at a pizza place. And so I was doing that for a little bit. And then, and then I got a job at an agency, a talent agency. Oh, cool. And that's a really great job for somebody coming out here to try to get. I didn't know anybody. This was a long time ago. I was just driving around one day, just trying to get a lay of the city and just kind of see where everything was. And I drove past a talent agency that I recognized called um, ICM, International Creative Management. And I was like, that name sounds familiar. It's certainly a nice building. They must, they must be important somehow. Right. So I went home and put on a suit and drove back there with my resume and just walked in and they were getting a new security company that day at the front desk. Cause these places are pretty locked down. You really right. can't get in there. And, but they were a little bit disorganized that day. So I just asked if they could drag me to human resources and the person pointed me back and I just started walking and they said, wait a second, do you have an appointment? And I said, uh, no. And so then I thought, well, that's it, I'm done. And they said, okay, well, sign in. So I was like, oh, okay. So I signed in, walked back, found human resources and, and all these cubicles and, and waited there. And this woman said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, my name's Byron. 
Velasco. I'm here to see about a job in your mailroom. And she was like, how did you get in here? And I was like, I just walked in. And then they had me escorted out. But I, th I threw my resume down on the desk. And a week later, they called me in for an interview. Um, and I started working in the mailroom there. So that was my first kind of break into the business. And so as I was there, I was writing um, a screenplay at night or on the weekends when I was not working at the agency. Because the agency jobs, you're an assistant there. It's really demanding. It takes up a lot of time. Yes. But, but you really do learn a lot about the business, the way it works, um, how deals are done. I worked for um, an agent that represents writers, so I got to meet all of his clients on the phone. So it really teaches you a lot about the business. And you're also meeting a bunch of other people your age because, um, you know, they're all trying to get their entry, their foot in the door. Do the same thing. Yeah. And, and what you realize 20 years later is that now some of my friends that were assistants with me are, are the heads of uh, studios and stuff like that. You know, it's kind of like your graduated class. But anyway, I was writing on the nights and weekends, wrote a script there. An agent really liked it and decided to sign me as a writer. And so I got an agent, which was great. And then eventually that movie I used as a sample to get me hired on a television show. And so, and so that's how, and, and I'm condensing like four years of life into, yeah. you know, a short story, but that's basically how, how it got going for me there. That's amazing. I love your hustle. I mean, you know, it was, a, it was a comic cause I'm not, I'm not by nature like, a, um, to, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a little more now, but then I wasn't necessarily like a, don't take no for an answer type of dude. Cause I, you know, I was just, but I was like, you got to try, you know? Yeah. And I drove out there. So I figured I might as well give it a shot. I, and I had, a, I was, I was naive enough not to know that it's ridiculous to walk into an agency and just try to ask for a job. Um, but that naivete kind of allowed me to do it. So, so, it, so in that sense, it was good. Um, yeah, and then I just worked my ass off to try to, you know, it, it's it's sort of, you get that first job and it's taking up a lot of your time and you're really tired because you're working so much. Yeah. And it's tempting to get to to forget about why you're really there and to, to lose focus. And I was there to be a writer. I wasn't there to be somebody's assistant. Yeah. And so I just made sure that, you know, a lot of nights I didn't go out. A lot of weekends I didn't go out. I, I stayed home and wrote. And kept my focus on that and um and it's hard to do because you have to be because it's sort of a self-motivating job you know it's easy to not do it nobody's going to care if you don't do it yeah so but i, I knew enough i mean I, I i could i realized early enough that i do not want to be an assistant forever i want to be a writer so the only way to do that is to write absolutely and uh what a freaking writer you are dude <laughs> your show is incredible <laughs> like thank you it, like, honestly, it's insane. My husband and I were uh, watching and then, you know, my, uh, Joanne is my cousin and I was like, man, I, I don't, we don't really know each other that well, but I've never really seen her in anything on Netflix. So mm -hmm. I, of course, you know, click to the channel and I'm looking and looking and watching and I could not believe how good the show was mm. in the first season. I was like, um, I'm usually not addicted to shows like this. Like I've got to work, <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting here staring at the TV, just watching and watching. And I'm like, God, the writing is so good. And it's so good. Like how, like, is this your first show that's like full length or? Yeah. I mean, this, this, well, this is my first show that I've created and wrote every episode for and ran the show. I mean, I've been working in TV for a long time, so I've written a million scripts that have been shot, but this was the first one that I was the sole creator and the sole showrunner on. Right. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was my first one. And I'm sure you must have been very proud of Joanna seeing her, her work on the show because she was so awesome. So proud. I yeah. was so proud. Um, unreal. I actually met her for the first time on my podcast. That's funny. Yes. Yeah. She's, um, she's just phenomenal. She's, and she was so, she had such a hard role to play. Yeah. Su such a role that people could, could, could really not like that character, but she brings such empathy uh, to the character that you just can't help but 
the other side. I wasn't sure, I, you know, I wasn't sure what to think about her character at first, because at first, you know, she's a little scarce. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's a really interesting character they put her in. And then as, you know, you watch and you go through season one and season two, and I'm like, she's kind of like my hero. <laughs> it's like she's coming full circle and you see her get yeah. stronger and stronger. And I, I love that. Yeah. I, you know, I actually tweeted her for the first time just to say, like, your chemistry with Jonathan Tucker on screen was, like, out of this world. Yeah. Yeah, well, they're both, they're both actors that bring just a ton of kind of raw emotion to it. And they really open themselves up and make themselves vulnerable. So together, it was very, they, had, they did have a ton of chemistry. Oh, it was amazing. How did you come up with the concept? So, you know, and a lot of people who listen in on this podcast and watch the YouTube channel videos and stuff like that, they are creators, uh, entrepreneurs, people who are self-starters, artists like myself. Mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how did you come up with the concept? Do you love MMA and you were a big fan and so you just kind of incorporated or did the story literally come left field and you just wrote it down? Like, how did, tell me about that process. So for a long time, I had been a fan slash fascinated <clears throat> by MMA. And I'm talking a long, long time ago, back before it was really on television, when you had to go get it as like a, a VHS tape somewhere. Right. Um, and it was, it was sort of an under, underground, not, not underground, but it just wasn't really in the, in the mainstream at all. So, but I was really fascinated by this, just this idea of these people that would get in a cage to fight for very little money, particularly back then it was no money. And yeah. what, where did they come from? What were, their other, what were their lives like outside of the cage? So it always intrigued me. You know, I, I, but, but I just kind of held on to the idea for years. And I'd kind of talk about it sometimes and people's eyes would kind of glaze over because they didn't really know what MMA was and it just sounded like kind of lowbrow meathead kind of thing. And I was like, no, you don't understand. It's, it's like a family drama, but still nobody, you know, so I kind of put it on the shelf and it was just always in the back of my mind. And then I was driving down Vine one day, which is a street out here. And there's a lot of billboards for movies and TVs uh, shows all, all around town. And I just thought to myself, man, if I see an advertisement for an MMA show that I didn't write, I'm going to be real fucking pissed off. Oh, and yeah. So I went home and started working on it. So I just started writing it on my own. And kind of took a while for me to crack it and figure out how I wanted to get into that into the world. And then I did. And... And then I had the script and we kind of sent it around for a while and, you know, weren't really getting any bites because of the subject matter. But then DirecTV said, we want to do, go straight to series and do 10 episodes. And um, a guy named Jeremy Gold, who was at a company called Indemol, which is the studio, was really the guy that, that first kind of championed the script and, and, and believed in it and really saw what I saw, which is like, yes, it's about MMA, but it's really about families. And it's, it's, it's just 100% a family drama. It's told on a little bit of a more visceral level because of the world that we're in, but it's the same things families go through. And I think that makes it relatable to people. So anyway, that's, that's sort of how it came about. Wow. Um, how long did it take for you to write the entire script? Like, I mean, three seasons worth. And there will be a fourth, so I know you're working on that. Yeah, I, we, I don't, I, we'll see what happens with that. They, no discussions have been had yet, but you never know what happens. Um, we have a bunch of really great fans who are definitely pushing hard for it. Um, your question, how long, what does it take for, for... How long did it take for you to write? Were you writing as the show was being filmed? Or? Yeah, you have to write, yeah, yeah. You typically, you know, I'd have a little lead up each season where I'd plan the season with, with my other writers and then, you know, have like, probably two scripts written before production, but production just eats up scripts so fast. So, so you're writing the whole time that you're, that you're producing and making the show. So it's a really, you know, it's a seven day a week, full time job um, that never ever stops. I mean, TV, it just is, it's, it's a relentless pace. Um, 
but then it ends and you get a little off season, you get a break to kind of recharge and, and, and get healthy again. And then you do it all over again. I, I can't even imagine. I mean, I, I haven't been really involved with TV. There's been a couple things I've done with TV and definitely not on the writing side of things. So I can only imagine how fast paced that was. And as they're, you know, wrapping up, you're having to, here you go, here you go, here you go, learn your script. Yeah. I mean that, that, the the machine of production is very motivating because you, you there has to be something to shoot so there has to be pages so you you get it done because you just don't really have a choice right so writer's block wasn't an option <laughs> it, it didn't even come into the equation oh that's awesome did you already know because the cast is so diverse i was wondering the first question i had for you is like did you already know who you were going to cast in this not at all really no, no. yeah i'd never worked with any of any of the actors on the show, except for Natalie Martinez. She and I had worked together years ago. Um, uh, yeah, she's great. Um, so, no, you write it and then you go through the casting process of, of, you have a casting director, ours was Kate Caldwell, and she presented me with all these people and um, Frank was the first one to get on board because we really had to cast that role of Alvi first. And so Frank and I met he was in New York at the time, but we met over Skype and, and just hit it off and saw it the same way. And it was pretty evident talking to Frank right away that he was, he was the guy. So once I met him, you know, I never wavered on making sure that got locked down. So once we got him, everything else was just an audition and, and people read and, you know, we, we got lucky and got the right people with the right chemistry, which is kind of one of those things you can't, you do the best you can, but you, you never really know until, until you're shooting. And, and it's all kinds of, you know, interesting stories about it. Like Tucker, Jonathan Tucker came in to read for the Ryan Wheeler role. And I, saw that, or I think maybe Mac told me that or yeah, something. Yeah. And, and, and Jonathan's, you know, Tucker's an awesome actor. So I was like, he could definitely play that role. But then I called him, later that night and said, would you mind coming back in for the J role? Because I think maybe that might be more interesting for you. Um, Matt, who played Ryan, he was like the first guy I saw. Wow. And, um, so, but he didn't want to, then, then he passed on, he didn't want to do it. And then we came back around and I think he ran into Tucker at a party or something and Tucker was like, Oh, I heard you auditioned for that. I think I might do it. And then got Matt interested again. And then we worked it out and then we had to get Matt's audition right to get it cleared at the network and all the stuff. Anyway, it's, there's a million long stories like that. And I'm sure Joanna told you hers and, you know, Jonas with Nick, that's kind of a story I've told a million times, but um, you know, I didn't want to read him. I didn't want him to be in the show. Because I didn't know who he was at the time. This was, you have to think back. This was a while ago. This was right after his band broke up the first time. Yep. And, you know, I just was like, I just, I don't want a Jonas Brother on, the sh on a show about MMA. It's just going to seem weird. But then Nick came in and just blew me away and came back like three or four times. And it was just undeniable he was the guy. So I ended up casting him. And that was just dumb luck that I, that, that I got. I, I said, what the hell, let's do it. Um, it we could because it was just undeniable. Anyway, million of stories like that, but it's 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 such a cra casting, such a crapshoot. You can really never, you never really predict until you until you see what's on the screen. And so right. we got lucky. Oh, it's undeniably one of the best casts I've ever seen. And I'm really honestly kind of fussy when it comes to shows because I'm moving yeah. 100 miles an hour. So I'm like, eh, what am yeah. I going to watch? What am I going to watch? And I. I didn't want to watch at first just because I wasn't an MMA person. My husband does MMA and he's Nick Jonas's doppelganger, which is hysterical. <laughs> he is. I show the whole cast that I've talked to so far. It's, it's ridiculous. We got stopped in Atlanta all the time. Nick Jonas. I was like, blue That's eyes. Hilarious. He got blue eyes. <laughs> That's so funny. It's, well, it's funny until you're his wife. <laughs> yeah, not, not a bad guy to be a doppelganger for though. Absolutely not. And, you know, and so I, luckily Nick has a great reputation and everyone gets excited to see him. So uh, that was <laughs> really interesting. But um, he he does MMA. Uh, that's like his sport of choice. And so he was like, oh, an MMA show. What? And it's got like drama and everything. So we that's how we really started. Then I realized 
my cousin was in it and I went oh yeah we got to watch this for sure so I told the whole family <laughs> and then, spread the word in Georgia get the word out there oh absolutely I've been telling everybody I actually just filmed um it was for my most recent music video but I I wore this in 50 awesome. percent of the scene because um, I was like oh we're just gonna we're gonna represent over here <laughs> right I love that and it's cool. I didn't know you were an Atlanta native or Georgia native. So that is really cool. Yeah. Inspiring for me. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, it's, it's, uh, you know, people, people say like, wow, that must have taken a lot of courage to move from Atlanta to Los Angeles. And I'm like, I guess, but you can always move back. It's not like we're getting on a boat and, and going like across yeah. the world. You're just getting in your car or, or a plane and, and, going and it's 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 still america it's not that big of a culture shock and if it doesn't work out just go back home it's not but you got to try i do have to yeah you know what i, I love it you said that because that's been my whole thing and i told my parents over here i was like listen i'm going to la next year i'm gonna give it i'm gonna give it my all you know for a, for a little bit and and worse come to worse i can come home but you know people's reactions are oh my god <laughs> It's like 17 hours, of, like in a plane. I was like, no, it's a five and a half hour flight. Like, it'll be yeah. okay. I can just come back if it yeah. doesn't work Direct out. Flight. Um, yeah, I mean, they, you know, you know, the, uh, the other thing I would say, uh, going back to, you know, making it or whatever, or that, that whole process, the thing I wish I could have known back then was just to let go of whatever timeline you think that you're on whatever whatever path you think your your success is supposed to happen it's not going to happen that way it's not going to happen when you think it is you're going to think it's happening and then it's not and then it's going to it, it'll come in some unexpected way and you know i if i would have there were many times before i actually got my first writing job where i was teed up to like something big, huge to happen you know something huge was about to happen or i was about to become like a major writer and then something fell through and I realized now if it would have happened at that point when I was like 22 or something 23 I probably would have blown it because I, I just wouldn't have been prepared to to follow follow it up or handle it or, or really understand you know what I was supposed to be doing the other thing I'd, I'd say too is two things keep an open mind about about what you want to do because what you want to do you may you may get out here um, I mean, I'm not saying you, but just anybody may, may come oh, out I'm and, listening, so. <laughs> yeah, and, may, and may get exposed to something completely new that didn't know existed. And you may find out that's what you want to do. And sometimes it's hard for people to let go of this, this identity that they think they formed by saying, I'm come, I'm going to do this. And they may realize I actually don't like this. I like this better, but I can't let go of this thing that I thought I wanted to do. Um, but once you do find the thing you want to do, you have to focus on it and stay focused and don't try to be a billion different things. Just get really, really, really damn good at one thing. You know, once you find out what that is. Right. You know? That's honestly the best advice I have heard from an industry perspective. So yeah. that's, thank you for that. Cause I needed to hear that too. So I know there's a, a million people who need to hear that. And it's, it's cool coming from someone who is doing something and who has accomplished something that is, big and on that note too what um what was your first initial reaction when you found out that you know your script was being picked up and you were you were filming 10 episodes like were you yeah i mean it was it was an interesting time because i was i was shooting i had just shot a pilot for um warner brothers and abc and we were in that process where they shoot all the pilots and then they decide which pilots they're picking up to series and so there's this one week leading up to um, uh, when all the networks are in New York making their big announcements and you're waiting to hear if your pilot's getting picked up. So I was doing this, I'd shot this pilot. It was really a, a miserable experience. I just wasn't working with the right people. You know, there were too many voices and too many people meddling in the show. And so it kind of became this show that I didn't really like and I didn't really know what I was making anymore but it looked like it was going to go series. And so I was sort of on the one hand 
excited because it would have been my first show. And on the other hand, dreading it because I'm like, I do not know what the hell the show is anymore. And as I was waiting to hear about that, Jeremy, uh, the studio exec I mentioned earlier, called and said, hey, DirecTV wants to do Navy Street because it, it was called Navy Street originally. They want to do 10 episodes of, of Navy Street. And I was like, oh my God, dude, I, this sucks because I think I'm going to have to do this other show right now. And then like a couple hours later, I got a call saying that show wasn't getting picked up. And so I was then free to do Kingdom or Navy Street, whatever you want to call it. Right. And so at that point, so there's the excitement of your shows picked up and that's awesome and you celebrate. And then there's a sort of crushing anxiety of, okay, okay, now I got to make this. And there's so many things you have to do to get it going. You got to hire the whole crew. You got to find your cast. You got to figure out where you're going to shoot it. You got to budget it. Uh, and that's all the easy part because you still have to write it. You have to like, you know, break the season and write all the episodes and it's got to be great. So, so a combination of, of being thrilled and um, being, you know, appropriately scared shitless. Yeah, I would say so. I was wondering if, if you were going to say anything like that, because I can only imagine getting the, the phone call like, hey, by the way, you got to film 10, like just 10 episodes at first, and then you're filming three seasons. And I, I can imagine that would be exhilarating, but gut-wrenching at the same time, for sure. It's yeah. a lot of pressure. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure, but that's what you're, that's what you're there for. And you never feel like you can do it, so, but you just, you just push through, because you kind of, you'll figure it out, you know? I mean, it's easy to say, everything sounds impossible, so it's really easy to say, uh, I'm not gonna do that, I'm not qualified, I can't do it, whatever. But, you know, everybody, everybody's kind of like, that. you just do it, you'll figure it out along the way, or you'll fail, and that happens too. Yeah. But, but that's better than not, that's better than avoiding it and not trying to do it. My motto is fail fast. Yeah. Yeah. Really, I mean, I mean, every, this is a cliche, but you definitely learn more from failures than you do from success. For sure. You know what not to do. And that's, I would say the most important part of the pie. Yeah. So that is awesome. So when you, how old were you when your foot was in the door? I got my first writing job when I was just turned 26. It's okay. So yeah, and that's that's pretty young, to be honest. I mean, yeah. that's it. so I so I got, but, but that still was four four and a half four or four and a half years of, you know, grinding out here. And you know, when you're in that, it feels like forever. But now I look back on, it, I'm like, oh, I was 26. I got lucky. Like that was fast, you know. But when you're when you're doing it, it feels like things are taking forever and they're not going at the speed you want them to, and they're just not going to. Like you're speaking into my soul, Byron. Who who told you? It happens. It happens. I'm supposed to be interviewing you. <laughs> like, no, I love I love that. What um, what was your most? Uh, what would you say out of the whole show so far was the most impactful scene, or like maybe your most your favorite scene if you have one? I know there's a lot, so. I don't. I don't have. I can't really say. I, I don't mean to not answer your question, but it's so hard for, I mean, I, I just think like if I picked a favorite scene, you could say three more, you know, a hundred more scenes and I'd be like, oh yeah, that, you know, and then some of them might just be a tiny scene or a tiny moment that didn't really land, make sense to anybody, but that I just love. So, right. you know, the whole show. I mean, I like, uh, I mean, I love the, the way it, and I love the last shot, the way it ends, you know, but, Me too. But, but that's, but I mean, I love a lot of stuff. I can't really choose. Well, that was the perfect, you know, when James and I were talking about, cause it ended and we were both sad. Um, mm -hmm. We were looking at the screen. I said, man, what a clever way to end mm -hmm. shot wise mm -hmm. that the, the series, because that's perfect to, for a pickup for a season four it, or a season five or six or whatever. If it were to happen, which I'm speaking it into existence, it will happen for you because it's it's a good show. It'll yeah. it'll come back for yeah. sure. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been also watching. This is a nerd point of view, but um, from a social media perspective, because I'm a you know, I've been watching your analytics, like not yours, 
personal mm. set, the show and everything like that. And I was telling Joanna, like you guys are, there's the, the traffic around the keyword kingdom is really building. Really? Mm -hmm. That's good. I do not know how to do any of that or track any of that, but just anecdotally, I can at least feel that exponentially more people are seeing the show now than they ever did while it was actually airing. It's happening analytically too. So mm -hmm. you, what you're feeling is uh, most definitely correct. And there's a lot of share of voice around kingdom right now as it's getting picked up. So you should, okay. you should remain excited because you know. Okay. Good. So, so it's still building. It's still building. Yes. There's no, I haven't seen a plateau yet. So. All right. Awesome. Yep. It's really cool. I, I really have enjoyed watching that too. And, um, you know, I have social listening tools that I'm like currently watching here. Yeah. And, and also for Joanna too. Cause I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. hey. I know she should have gotten, I mean, I, I don't think she's ever got, I think she's getting it now a little bit, but I don't think she ever got the recognition at all. She deserved for her work on kingdom. She that's what, that, that's the frustrating thing I think is that if we were on a, a play, if we would have been on a platform, if we would have been on Netflix from the beginning or a network that had more reach, you know, she should have an Emmy. If Absolutely. She, like a, a couple, a lot of people should have on that show, I think. Yeah, the two I'm seeing uh, a lot of is um, John, Jonathan. I don't want to call him John. I don't know him like that, but Jonathan and uh, Joanna. As far as Emmy, yeah. that's what I'm Absolutely. seeing. Absolutely. Absolutely, and I'd throw, I'd throw Frank in there. Um, I throw, I throw Matt in there playing Ryan. I mean, I, you know, Ryan. I love the character of Ryan. I love writing him. I love what Matt did with him. You got Paul Walter as Keith, you know. Yes. Oh. You know, I mean, the whole cast. I could make a case for everybody. You know, I have enormous respect for Paul specifically yeah. too, because that role was a really, I mean, that's an odd ball role to play, right? And um, he did it seamlessly. Yeah. I not one time on screen do you see him like trip over a word or or how his facial expressions are set or anything like that. Perfect. Yeah. Board. Well, he's a massively talented dude, obviously. Uh, you know, I, I think the secret's out. You know, he's, he's obviously, his career is going pretty well, so. <laughs> I would say, so. But there will always be a special place for Kingdom, though, for him. Yeah, totally. Always. And um, so when you were younger, and I'm wrapping up some questions with you, but when you were younger, did you, did you write when you were younger, or did you have totally different ambitions as a kid? Um, no, I did I mean, I didn't really write all that much, you know, um, in college, I sort of got, that's sort of when I got more into it, you know, but in high school, I was just, you know, running around being a regular high school kid. Um, music was probably more of an influence on me at that point. But then in college, I started drifting towards that. And I kind of realized, I sort of figured out that I, I, I was good at it. You know, it was, it was one of those things where it was something that I was wanting to do that nobody was like pushing me to do. And, you know, I'm very, I'm pretty, I'm pretty realistic about my limitations. You know, I know what I'm good at and not good at it. And I could tell that I was good at this. Sure. And so I just said, well, I might as well see where it goes. I love that. What, no. were you a musician? Is that what you were? No, 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 not really. It just, it was just what, like, it, it just was what influenced me. I just cared about music, you know, more than like plays or, you know, writing. And I loved movies, um, maybe like slightly more than your average person, but I wasn't, I mean, I guess I, I love movies more than most in high school, but not like, I wasn't a film nerd or anything like that. Right. And TV, I didn't think about it at all because back then there just wasn't really, TV just wasn't that interesting. That's what I hear. I wasn't, I wasn't around, but yeah. I, I hear that it was um, a little boring. Yeah, it was just, you know, there were some good shows. I mean, there were some seminal shows out there, but, but it wasn't like it is now. It, it, did, it, it wasn't the sort of dominant art form that it kind of is now. Right. And um, as an artist, like from artist creative to artist. I have to say thank you for inspiring me. Um, it's 
So I'm actually I'm actually writing a song called Kingdom because you inspired me. Awesome, love that. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad that I I hope the show. I'm glad that the show touched you in some way. Yeah, it's yeah. relatable. I, I think anyone who's ever had a family or you know mm -hmm. anything I mean, find yeah. it relatable. It's very cool. So yeah. thanks for your craft. We appreciate you. You're welcome. Awesome. And what's next? This is my last question for you. What's next for Byron Belasco? Well, you know, the world out here is pretty weird because of the, because of COVID. So, you know, production shut down. It's starting to open up a little bit. Um, so I have two scripts finished that we're waiting to take out. I, I'm in a deal at a studio right now. So I have two scripts written and ready to go for two different shows. Um, but we got to, the, the mark, the, the business has to, I mean, the production and everything has to open up a bit before before we see anything. And then a couple other other projects that I'm like close to jumping on to and, and, and then a movie. But um, so a lot going on, but we're, all, but we're also in kind of a weird, like everybody else in the country, our business is in a sort of strange holding pattern, you know? Speaking of movies, since you're involved in all this, have you ever thought about being an actor on your own? <laughs> <laughs> like ever, has it ever crossed your mind? Um, no, because I think I'd suck. And I think, well, I, I'll tell you in college, <laughs> I had to take like a couple of acting classes yeah. as part of my major, which was to, which was writing. And one of the best things the writer can do is take acting classes because it really does teach you, you know, what is, what an actor can do and what they can't do. You know, and it really teaches you about language and words. Like when you try to actually perform them, you'll say, God damn it, like this is not good. I, I can't, no human can say these words. So yeah. it teaches you a lot about that. Or, or but so I did a I did a little bit in that class and just I didn't love it like I loved writing. And you know, I also like don't like the way I look on camera, you know, I don't like you know, I, I just couldn't, I just, I couldn't do it. It's like, it's a thing that some people just have. And, um, you know, I just don't have it. Well, so, I would, you know, <laughs> know your strengths and your weaknesses. You know your strengths and your weaknesses, exactly. I love that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Uh, yeah. My audience is going to be very, very, very excited to see you and hear from you. So this has been great. Thank you for opening up too about how you got your start and where you're at and what's next for you because it's super inspiring for fellows who are, we're tracking along the same track. So yeah. it, it's cool. It's awesome to learn from you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you and good luck with everything and um, welcome to Los Angeles. <laughs> Thanks, maybe I'll All see right. you around. <laughs> see Bye. you later. Bye.